Mary Jackson. Okay. Now, well, actually, not a, it's not an indictment. It's an information. <clears throat> Everybody know the difference between an information and an indictment? No. Okay. An indictment is when the, the uh, district attorney goes to the grand jury and, and the grand jury looks it over and if they think that the person should be prosecuted, they then indict the person. Yeah, basically, right, bring charges in plain English, but they call it an indictment. If the, if the prosecutor does not go to the grand jury, the alternative procedure is that he puts together what's called an information. It's basically an affidavit, in other words, a statement under oath, under penalty of perjury. And he takes that to a judge, a, a, actually to a magistrate, okay? And the magistrate kind of functions like a grand jury, and he decides whether or not the prosecutor can proceed. The United States Constitution, and let's look at the Fifth Amendment. It says, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. So there is no information possible, felony or a misdemeanor, it has to be a grand jury indictment. And so that's what an information is. So in this case they prosecuted her based on information rather than based on grand jury indictment. Now, remember this important concept. A, the sovereign establishes the court, the plaintiff. When you, when you, if you're the plaintiff, you determine what form you want to go in. You determine what the laws are and so forth that you're going to prosecute under, whether it's civil or whatever. The, uh, the IRS is assuming the posture of a sovereign. They are opening up their court and they're bringing their charges. Now, after everything I've told you, you know that they cannot be sovereign relative to the people. They are sovereign relative to the citizens, right? Is that clear? The people own the government and the government owns the citizens. So the IRS is taking the position when they, when they file their claims, they're taking the position that they are sovereign and they're treating the defendant as if he were a citizen. They don't stop to ask, are you one of the people or one of the citizens? They just roll on forward and assume you're a citizen. So here we are right out of the UCC. This is California's Commercial Code 1206, but it's the same as UCC 1-206. Whenever this code creates a presumption with respect to a fact or provides that a fact is presumed, the trier of fact must find the existence of the fact unless and until evidence is introduced that supports a finding of its non-existence. So if you don't put into the record that you're not a 14th Amendment citizen, the corrupt court system will presume that you're subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. So look what it says in this indictment, or I mean in this information. First is, this is basically this first page is a notice, or it's a summon. You are hereby summoned. So that's the first page. We go to the second page, and notice what it says. This is count one. On or before April 16, 2001, in the Northern District of Georgia, the defendant, Sherry Peel Jackson, <clears throat> who is required by Title 26 United States Code and by regulations made under the authority thereof to make a federal income tax return for the calendar year 2000. Right there is the declaration of the law by the sovereign, the decree. Right? Do you all see that? Who, who is the plaintiff in this case? 
The IRS. Sherry's a defendant. The IRS is the plaintiff. Who's the sovereign of the court? The IRS, right. That's the position that they've adopted. You've learned your lesson well. Okay? So now the sovereign has spoken. The, the sovereign says, you're required to file. That is the decree of the law. See, it looks like, you know, the, to the person who's not made aware of this, it looks like, okay, they made their statement as required, okay, and you're going to defend against it and so forth. No, this is the law decreed by the sovereign. Okay? And having had and received gross income in excess of 12,950, the minimum filing requirement for calendar year, see, that's another declaration of law. That's the minimum filing requirement. Specifically stating the items of our gross income and any deductions and credits, and he's calling it income. That's also a decree. He's saying, what is? This is not, shall we investigate? This is, this is what is. See, it's a very affirmative statement. And it goes on to say she, what her violation of that law was. She violated she willfully failed to make such return at the time required by such law and such regulations. That is, on or before April 16th, in violation of Title 26, United States Code, Section 7203. So first they decree the law, and then they say that she violated that law, and that this is supported by another law that they're also decreeing. See, one of the things you, you, you got to uh, really perceive here is that I can say that that black car is white, okay? I can say that black car is white if I'm the plaintiff. And if the court says the black car is white, then it's white. Okay, that's the law. Now, a person looking at it say, well, how did he ever come to a conclusion like that? Doesn't matter how he did. The point is, the court came to, had a consideration, considered it, and came to his conclusion. Right or wrong, there it is. Now, some people, sometimes it gets so gross, you appeal it, and, and the appellate court will admit that there was a violation of, um, that, that there was a violation of discretion on the part of the judge and so forth. But that's when it becomes you know, politically infeasible. What are you saying? I mean, is everybody in tune with me what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. The IRS is assuming the posture of sovereign and then they are decreeing what the law is and then they're saying here's how the law got violated. Okay? Now, look at Sim Cannon's case. Sim Cannon was very, very similar. I don't have his paper here, but here's what they did. They went through the whole process, defense and all that sort of stuff, got to the jury. The jury sent a note to the judge asking, did they have to go through all 700 pages of information to find the law, or could the judge provide them the law? The judge wrote a, letter, a note back to the jury and he said, I have already made a determination that the law requires him to file. The, the, the jury only has to determine whether or not he filed. Okay? So, and in the trial, Sim Cannon always admitted that he didn't file. So it was a slam dunk for the jury to decide. And the judge didn't lie. The, the indictment came in, the IRS, I'm sure, decreed the law just in the same style that you see for Sherry. And so, then they came through and they, and, uh, they prosecuted, right? They said he violated and they prosecuted, and this is where they ended up. Okay. So, that's the law. It didn't exist until the moment of accusation but the sovereign said so. 
and the judge knows this but the judge is not going to fight the sovereign right it's not his job even if he sees it's wrong it's not his job okay so that's how it's done and Sherry did no counterclaim correct okay now look at count two not much to look at actually yeah. same deal Required by Title 26 United States Code. They don't even cite the code. He just says they're required. Well, it's true until proven otherwise. And then who has the discretion? And the way they worked it out, you know, <laughs> she lost. All right. Who wrote required this? by. Uh, th who wrote this brief? This is not a brief. This is the information against okay, it. This is this is the who wrote it? the the uh, United States Attorney wrote it. Okay, but you, do you see the, the mechanics of it is the sovereign opens up his case, chooses his court, chooses his forum in the court, decrees the law, then says the law was violated, and then the jury, not understanding all of this, the jury thinks it's got to decide the facts. Did he or did he not, or did she or not do whatever they say is required? And of course, they always say he didn't because they, the defendant always admits that they didn't file. That's not the question in the defendant's mind. And then the defendant says, show me the law. Right? Where's the law? But they're looking over at the codes. It's not there. Never was there. And the judge sits there and he sees the law, but he doesn't take sides. He, he remains mute, says nothing. Does everybody genuinely see this, how it's working? Slam dunk. Slam dunk. Yeah, that's why they're getting so many convictions. Well, that's, how did Tommy Cryer win? Yes. So uh, what should have happened in order to invoke common law at the time this Counterclaim, sue back. I'm the sovereign and you're the agent. You are exceeding your authority. You bring back your own dec decreeing of law. Is the period of time you can do this? Instantly. At the very beginning. Yeah. Yes, instantly. Do not wait. Come yeah, right yeah. back. First, punch back. Yeah. Well, you know. well you after 30 days. there's a maxim. There's a maxim, okay? Yeah. Legal maxim. The law does not protect he who slumbers on his rights. Wow. And ignorance of the law is considered equal to slumbering. Okay? You if you haven't that. taken the time to learn about the law, learn your rights, learn the system, and I'm not blaming you, I'm just saying, you know, because the educational system is all set up to encourage you to not know what your rights are, all right? <laughs> to not understand the system. And so y y we know where to put the blame for the training but the fact is, is the courts operate as if you were sovereign, and because you're sovereign, you are fully responsible, and if you're ignorant, well, that's too bad. Seen one count, you've seen them all, okay? Mm -hmm. Count three, required by Title 26 United States Code and by regulations made under the authority thereof to make a federal income tax return for the calendar year 2002, and so on and so on and so on. Whatever, yeah. Okay, count four. Same deal. That's it. Do I have to spend a whole hour explaining this? No, no. Sherry, Sherry, I believe, is appealing, and she's out until... No, I, I think she's been given a couple of months before sentencing. But she really ought to go back on. I sent an email to her husband, and other people are telling me that they're, they're going to send mail to him. But, you know, it isn't going to work for her. You know why? Because she herself must be herself in this process, and she doesn't know she's going to say the wrong things and slap herself right in the jurisdiction again. I'd sue them. I'd put the counterclaim together and sue them. Serve them with the counterclaim. Look, a counterclaim is no different than an ordinary lawsuit. It has all the same things. The real difference is the name. Okay? It's called a... Yeah, it's counterclaim instead of claim. Change the title, okay? 
And they, they are now counter defendants and you're counter plaintiff. But that's the important thing, you're the plaintiff. And then you, you establish your sovereignty in your paperwork. I'll show you that in a few minutes how you do that. But you establish your sovereignty and now that you're in your sovereign capacity and it's your court and you decreed what the law is, and remember, they're servants. There is nothing in the Constitution, nor can there be anything in the statutes, because the statutes must conform to the Constitution. There is nothing there that authorizes them to take command of a sovereign. You understand that? Yeah. Well, they can, uh, let's put it this way. I, I, I don't like saying giving them jurisdiction, but anybody in all, involved in anything can always back off and say, I'm not going to do it anymore, you know, if that's what they want to do. Are you sure that you all see this? I mean, this is really important to, to get this picture. <coughs> well, I, I've allocated one hour to talk about everything on this and two hours about the counterclaim. So. We've been on schedule despite appearances that we've been wasting time here and there and slippage and so forth. I took. Good. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> I bet you were, weren't you? <laughs> Anyhow, see, I, 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 I'm, I'm really intent on this. I want you to really, truly, in your gut, see that they decreed the law and that is the law at the moment of the, of the case. Yeah. You file the counterclaim, then you have to wait. Well, yeah. Anytime you, anytime you file a, uh, file a counterclaim, they have 30 days to answer. But when you file the counterclaim, the counterclaim is based on jurisdiction. So nothing can happen until the issue of jurisdiction is resolved. When you challenge jurisdiction, everything must stop. Now that doesn't mean they stop. They'll try to push forward. Okay. And then you have to go through enforcement procedures to stop them, like a motion to, to, to uh, uh, stop them of some kind, okay? Yeah, to cease, a motion to cease or whatever. Uh, uh, a, actually, a motion for prohibition, okay? To prohibit them from proceeding. Or to stay, a stay motion. There you go, that's the word. Okay. You, Do you have to go to the court again? Or they send you mail? Of course you go through the court. Of course you file in the court. You can file by mail. But you know, you, you file in the court, sure. But that's the counterclaim. I want, I, I want to focus on this. If there's any doubt about any aspect of this, what I'm telling you, raise it now. Because I'm going to assume you all got it when we get to the next step. Make sure that we touch upon the fact that the IRS, as of March 27, 2007, has been under a stop. Uh, has been what? They have been stopped. Okay. According to the law, it is now four and a half years and since they have ignored the uh, subpoena by Mr. O'Neill. And so therefore, they are now stopped. So they are out of business. Okay. Now, who's funding them to still continue doing their business? And well, how are we letting them get away with it? Well, the, apparently there was a court action in which resulted in some sort of a stopal order on the IRS. Now, she's saying, who's funding them and keeping them going? How come they keep going? Well, the answer is simple. Nobody's, nobody's enforcing it. That's all. They chose to ignore it. They move on and nobody enforces it. So there you are. What, what should happen is whoever got that order should then bring them in for contempt of court. And then the court can use its contempt powers then to put everybody in jail if necessary to get that order obeyed. But that's a separate issue. If nobody complains about an order being disobeyed, it's as good as obeyed as far as the court's concerned. You've got to bring things before the court. Remember this, when you, when you want something from the court, you always do it with a motion. The first motion that you make is not called a motion. The the first motion you make to a court has a special name. It's called a complaint. But it is a motion just like anything else. Yeah, you basically, you make a request of the court and you, you provide all the supporting evidence and then uh, uh, 
and then the other person gets a chance to answer, and then you get to reply to the answer, and then they get to uh, reply to the reply, and it goes back and forth under common law. Under, under the present equity system, there's only three papers. You make the initial paper, and then there's the answer, and then there's a reply to the answer. You're not allowed to bring up new issues in the reply to the answer. The purpose of the reply is to reply to the new issues brought up by them. See, they answer your accusations, but then they can bring up something. So then you have to have an opportunity to, to reply to that, and then that's where they cut off normally. So, uh, but that is, they keep saying, show me the law. There it is. That is the law, the decree of the sovereign. And they are sovereign until somebody comes along and says, no, you're not. But you have to do it the right way, and defending is not good enough because defending, see, the, def they, the plaintiff is the sovereign, the defendant is the subject of the sovereign. So you got to flip that relationship. And you do it with a counterclaim. The counterclaim comes back and says, hey, wait a minute. I'm the sovereign here, and you guys are doing this wrong. And when you challenge jurisdiction, that's the point. When you're challenging jurisdiction, everything stops because they have to prove to your court that they do have jurisdiction. You know, It always starts off with somebody presenting something accusation or request or whatever, and then the other person comes back and says yay or nay, and then the other one comes back another time. You know, it, that's the pattern of life. Okay, and in this case they're giving a presentment, and when you counter it in court without doing a counterclaim, they just overrule you and go on. Where right, yeah, because see, you're not, you're not saying that they injured you, you're saying I haven't injured him. Oh. Well, so the question centers around the complainer. So you've got to come back and, you see, normally the, normally the uh, defendant, by custom of what we say, okay, what we say isn't necessarily what we do, but by custom of what we say, the defendant is innocent until proven guilty. But that's not how it works, really. No. You're guilty until proven innocent. You're condemned the, Sure. And the proof of that is if you don't answer, you default and you are guilty. See, that, yeah. that's how it works. Now, that doesn't work that way in criminal proceedings. See, no. criminal proceedings, if you don't answer, they have to find you, catch you, and bring you in before they can default you. Yeah. And, and it's not a default. They, they have to go through the paces. Right. So they, in, in the civil type thing or in the common law situation, the accusation is made, and then there's the default or the presumption, and then you have, the only way you can get around this is you have to say, wait a minute, where is your jurisdiction? In all proceedings, normally, if you make an accusation, you have to also provide the evidence. When you challenge jurisdiction, that's, that is the one exception to the rule. When you challenge jurisdiction, all you have to say is, what jurisdiction? And the burden is on the defendant to prove that he had jurisdiction in his case. Mm -hmm. That's the one case where the burden of proof falls on the accuser, I mean on the defendant, actually counter defendants, okay? So he cannot proceed until he proves jurisdiction. Now, if you don't question jurisdiction, he automatically has it. There's another rule. If you fail to object, it means you agree. That's universal among all courts. Okay? You have to object. And you object with a counterclaim or you object by other methods. But if you don't do any objection, that means you agree. <coughs> so here we are, Sherry Jackson again. They made the ac accusation. She never objected to the law. What she said, I'm guessing, is where is the law? Show me the law. They did. And they did. Only she didn't know it. And her attorney didn't know it. Mm -hmm. See? You think the attorney really didn't know it? I'm sure he didn't know it. So I'm sure. These, these guys are not that bright, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're intelligent, yes, but they're not that well educated. 
I mean, this is a whole completely different view based on sovereignty and such. They don't get that kind of training in law school. So he looks at it. Oh, all right, this is the accusation. So we do the standard defense. And then they get convicted, and everybody wonders why. Look at uh, Erwin Schiff. OK, Erwin Schiff, same deal. He got, I guess, indicted. In his case, I think he got indicted. But nevertheless, now I talked to Erwin Schiff, and uh, I could just tell just by the way he reacted that he wasn't really seeing it, what I was saying to him. Of course, I only had a few seconds, really, to talk to him because somebody else had convinced him to call me, OK? And so we eventually got together in a discussion, and we talked for, I guess, a half hour or something like that, a good, good length of time. But the point is, is that just before he went through all that, well, maybe a year before he actually got convicted, uh, I tried to tell him this stuff. And I tried to bring it to his attention about uh, 26 U.S.C. 7806, which says the rest is not law. He didn't buy any of it. And then he, he, just before he hung up, he said, well, I'll call you later. I, I'll get back to you on this. And I said, I don't think you will. He says, oh, yeah. He says, I'll get back to you. But I could just tell by the way he's receiving it. I was just simply on Mars, you know? Somebody coming in and saying that you can dump the judge and that type of thing, it's just, you know? But you can see here, I've got, I've got the cases that back up what I'm saying, the, the, the constitutional statements, and of course there's some interpretation, and then presumably you're looking at exactly what I'm looking at, and presumably you can come to the same conclusions I do based on those same things. But it was just too far out for him, and he stayed with the standard route of, of defending, but the problem is, is that the government was absolutely out to get him. And so that judge did everything within his power to stop the appropriate evidence from getting to the jury. Okay? And they are. Yeah. Did you look at the Larkin Rose case at all? No. But I got I've been my experience has been that everybody who truly really knows their subject. And Larkin Rose does know the subject. I don't take that away from him. They can't switch to a different philosophy. Yeah. See, it's not, it's not that they don't know or do know or don't know. It's a question of a system of thought. And this thing totally inverts the whole structure. Now, if somebody will listen to me several hours, like you have, I can lead you through the path that leads to the conclusion. And then once you see it, well, at least I think it becomes obvious. You know? But you have to get down that path. Talking to somebody on the phone for one hour doesn't do it. See, and that's all I usually get with these guys. So uh, there's not too much hope of me uh, of them seeing this without somebody really spending some quality time with them and and giving them an opportunity to challenge. And then one more thing, they have to actually listen to the answer. And and these. These people who are well versed in their subject area often are not good at listening. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah, now look, I hope you guys pin me to the wall on this if I ever quit listening. Okay? Because, I mean, it, I, I've seen the tendency in myself too. You know, you know it so well, somebody comes off the wall with something different, obviously they're wrong. You know? A bad attitude, but it, it, it just human nature, you tend to gravitate toward that. Cognitive like, dissonance. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you see, um, uh, hopefully I can self correct before you guys have to correct me. But uh, it is a n natural human tendency to, when you become expert in your field, to then frankly disregard anything that comes along that obviously doesn't work. Obvious in my own mind, and yet it does work, see? <laughs> But I, I, I say, I ask them a key question. Sometimes I try to offset, and, and rarely does it work, but sometimes it does. I'll say, all right, you go to court and you lose a case. What do you do? Who made the decision? They say, well, the judge did. All right, so how do you handle that? 
Well, we appeal it. Okay. I say, that's not what I do. So they say, what do you do? I say, I issue an order vacating his decision. Can you do that? <laughs> no response. Well, right. They can't do that. They don't do that. And they don't believe that I did it. Okay. So, you know, it's really tough to get through to, to people who already have <coughs> basically, <laughs> see, they've paid their dues. And I can understand somebody who's paid his dues to not exactly uh, cotton to somebody who's just new, new in their minds, new on the, in this business. But I've been doing this now for, well, I've been at this since around 1983. Okay, but I didn't really get understanding until about 1990. That that's when I started. And, and, and I didn't do it by myself. I had a tremendous amount of help from a lot of people, you know, and discussions and points of view and so forth. So it, it was a, a long road to coming to where I came on this stuff. And then hopefully it's organized well enough so that you guys can now pick it up and at least do something with it. If they charging me this more, so they use that as more as a capital so they could make business out of me as a Okay, whoa. but that's a whole different area well, than what this seminar is about. Well, they're taking you guys yeah. anywhere. You I know. We've, we've heard a lot about, about the fact that when somebody is taken into custody that they become an asset of some kind and where people can somehow the bonding process and so forth. But our purpose here in the seminar is to show you and what the law is and how to deal with it. So uh, this is really critical. If anybody has any doubts about the fact the law was decreed at this point and how it was decreed, say it now because that, this is critical to the next step that I want to go to. Well, you're not in jail right now, so. Right. Not right now. Not right now, yeah. Not right now. Good. Mm -hmm. Give me time. Yeah. yeah. And neither is Linda Wall of Preferred Services if she did his approach, she didn't, I don't know if she did use a counterclaim or not, but again, she questioned jurisdiction, jurisdiction, right. jurisdiction, they dismissed. It's easier, it's easier to, to do that dismissal with a counterclaim than it is because you're putting their paychecks at risk. Yeah. Yeah, right from the get-go, right you're in court. The they're, they're acting yeah. as a judge the whole night, the whole shebang. You, you, anytime you have any interaction with these people, Never forget that you're always in court, right from the beginning. The moment he, that cop opens his mouth and says anything that's against your interest, you're in his court. Okay? And yeah, so you, right from the get-go, it's what's your authority? You know, you may still get arrested, but it's what's your authority. That's right. You can be nice about it. You can be non-challenging in the sense you say, I don't understand what your authority is. You know, you can be nice, but... Don't ever let that point get away. I, I had one that worked. <coughs> a cop pulled me over for mm -hmm. crack windshield and expired registration. First thing I asked him was, where was the emergency? Was there a life-threatening situation? He said, no. Why? I said, but you turned on your lights. They're only supposed to be legally used for life-threatening situations. You didn't violate the law, did you? Mm, there you go. That's a cute one. He said, well, tell you what. Fix your windshield and do your registration on your way <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, I haven't dug into that issue myself, but mm -hmm. my understanding is, is that they can only pull you over for probable cause, and probable cause means the committing of an arrestable offense. Yep. And Say, not only a that. A real crime, not, not a, an infraction. Jump to the next step, which is the remedy. How do you deal with this? Well, in a word, it's a counterclaim. Okay? That's all. Counterclaim. And you challenge the jurisdiction. What is your jurisdiction? Uh -huh. Let me show you. Um, uh, I can show you a format on the counterclaim so you can see it. Now, the thing is, is that different courts have different formats. Uh, if you're in California or if you're in the Ninth, uh, ninth uh, well, maybe not. I won't say the Ninth Circuit. But <laughs> it, at least in California, there's a very definite statewide format, which is controlled by the rules. But you can, you will find in other states they have other formats. So what I'm saying here, the format may be different, but the but the the elements are the same. 
you still have to say who the plaintiff is, who the defendant is, but where you put those things on the, where you type them on the page varies from one jurisdiction to the next. But let's see, let's go back to, um, we'll get out of this, this one. Mm -hmm. Did you ever hear from Sherry's husband? Never. That's okay. I did my part. You know, I, 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 I'm a strong believer in the concept that I am no more interested in a person case than he is. It saves me a lot of work. The pilot? No. Oh, the, I've heard of uh, the pilot, yes. I don't, didn't know the name, but I'm not familiar with the case, no. But I'm sure it runs along the same lines. Yeah, I mean, sure every, every person I've talked to, I mean, I, I, I know about Al Thompson. I know about uh, Sim Cannon. There's another guy, Jerry, something or other, who was out toward uh, Redondo Beach somewhere in that area. And, um, and Irwin Schiff, you know, and he, all these guys, they, they, they defend. You can't defend in deals like this. I mean, it's a slam dunk pretty much to get you. Once in a while, one of them gets through the system, like, you know, that attorney, what's his Tom name? Cryer. Yeah, Cryer. Tommy Cryer was very, he, he got, he, I won't say he got lucky. I'm sure he, he did his research and he was very effective, but it was a fight right down to the end. With this approach, the fight pretty quickly comes to an end because you're out. You're suddenly you're issuing orders. You know, <laughs> that's a lot nicer position to be in. Uh, they always say that I'm wrong, but I have yet to have any of them say why I'm wrong. To actually objectively say this is wrong because of this, 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 or whatever. Don't get that. I'm just wrong. So to me, that's the acid test. I think I may be on the right track. Now, first of all, I want you to show you how to structure the lawsuit itself. Let me explain something about the term lawsuit, okay? Now, I've been talking about lawsuit all along, but I want to tell you right now that legally speaking, I'm using the wrong word, okay? What it really is is that you have actions at law and you have suits in equity, okay? Or equity suits. When you talk about a suit, that's equity. When you talk about an action at law, that's law. Okay? Then along around the beginning of the, last, uh, of the prior century, they came up with this great fantastic idea. They said, let's put them together. There's only one form of action. You ever seen that? Mm -hmm. You've seen that in your studies, right? One form of action. So they have Law and equity combined, they're no longer wanting to distinguish it. The problem is they have to distinguish it because the Constitution has not changed. Yet that's a constitutional factor. Law is different from equity. So until they change the Constitution, they can't really se can't separate, I mean, cannot combine them. But nevertheless, they, they put the procedures together. And if you look carefully, you will see that some of the court rules conflict with other court rules. And the reason is, is because the one set of court rules is law and the other set is equity. It's two different systems, but they don't identify them as such. I think, I'm not sure, I think it's Rule 7A and Rule 7C of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. I think it's Rule 7 anyway, and I can't remember if it's A and C or B and C, but there's a conflict between the two rules. You look at them, they say, wait, wait a minute. They, One's co kind of contradicting the other. That's why. One's common law and the other is, is uh, equity-based, okay? So um, when they tried to combine them together, that's when they started calling these things lawsuits, okay? So what we're doing, what I'm advocating here is doing actions at law. Your counterclaim it will be an action at law and not a suit. So all this time I've been using the word lawsuit, I was really technically incorrect. It's actually an action at law, or just an action. But everybody says lawsuit. So <laughs> as long as you understand that, it's OK. All right, so here's how you put together a lawsuit, or actually an action at law. <clears throat> this particular case. 
is an original action. It was done very sloppily, so the plaintiff revised it, and the plaintiff put together a first amended action. So when you look at this action, the very first paragraph is normally not, not included. And it says, the first amended action amends by entire substitution the action filed October 7th, 1998 in the above entitled court. So that explains the relationship between the amended action and the original action. Normally that paragraph wouldn't be there. Normally paragraph two would be paragraph one. Okay? And here's what it says. William Jones, here and after plaintiff, is one of the people of California and in this court of record complains of and then names the defendants, okay? And it also describes the type of action here, I think, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, it says, in a plea of trespass and trespass on the case. Trespass is when somebody is injured because of violence. Where violence is involved, it's called trespass. Being punched in the eye is trespass. Trespass is not like one attorney said when I was in court, this attorney said, Your Honor, there's no real estate involved in this case. There's no trespass. She obviously didn't understand trespass. So trespass um, is where violence is involved or the threat of violence. You either sign here on this ticket or I'll take you in, ar arrest you. That's a trespass, okay, if he's violating your rights. The other one, four words, trespass on the case. Trespass on the case is where an injury occurs where there's no violence. For example, let's say a con artist sucked you into a, a fraudulent contract, okay? Not through threat, but just simply cheated you, okay? You were injured. Since there was no physical violence and no threat of violence, then there is no trespass it is now trespass on the case if you were injured. And an injury does not mean a physical injury. It can be financial injury, okay, or emotional injury. So that's the difference between the two. In this case, they sued for both, trespass and trespass on the case, because there were elements from both. Okay, now, look at this. I want you to really look closely at this first line. Not the first paragraph, but the first line of the paragraph. William Jones. There he identifies himself. Here and after plaintiff, there he gives him an, himself an easy alias. Sometimes it's easier to refer to a person by his character, his nature, or something, rather than using his name. It makes it easier to read the rest of the, of the action, okay? In one case, I had a case where uh, the police had, uh, arrested somebody, okay? That's what the police said. We thought it was a kidnap. Now, in your actions, whenever you do an action, you never put in your conclusions unless you say that you are concluding. But you never say that the person was kidnapped because maybe it wasn't. That's a, that's a judicial determination, was he kidnapped or not. But you're suing because you were carried away without your permission. Okay, see the difference? However, what we did in the suit, or in the action, now that you know, I gotta say it right. What we did in the action, we said, uh, uh, Mr. Jones, Mr. John Jones, here and after kidnapper. <laughs> now he had an alias. We didn't say he was a kidnapper, we're just saying this is his new name that we're gonna use through the rest of the complaint. <laughs> So you can do stuff like that. Uh, if you, you think about it, and if you can generalize your thinking, a lot of times you can transfer things. And he had a perfect case for me. So I went up there, I talked to him. He appointed me as a special master in his court. Now twice before, he had moved for habeas corpus with an informal request from inside the jail, which is okay. And twice, the Superior Court judges rubber stamped the denial on, on him being held by the Municipal Court. That's when he asked me to be involved. So I went in, I started researching it, 
after we settled it, he, get, he signed a paper appointing me as a special master in his court, assigning me by his sovereign authority the duties to hold hearings, to investigate, and to whatever it takes in order to gather the information. And, and so I began to do that. Well, then on, on uh, somewhere in the middle of the week, there was a jailhouse rumor that he was going to be pulled into court the following Monday. So on the following Monday, oh by the way, I filed the special master assignment with the clerk. And I met the chief clerk, I said to the chief clerk, I said, and I was dressed just like an attorney, suit, tie, I had a vest, had no beard, okay? I looked like, very much like an attorney. And I said to, the, I said to this person, I said, the reason I'm, I wanted to talk to you is that I want you to know that you're gonna see some very unusual paperwork come through. But I don't want you to think I'm a kook, <laughs> you know? But this is extremely unusual. We're invoking laws that you, won't, you don't see every day. And so she, and, and I was very presentable and, and calm and, you know, and so she accepted me personally. Well, the day came when I filed these papers, had no problem, they were greased right in. And so I filed this appointment for a special master. So then I went down to the court on that Monday morning and I requested to see the judge in chambers because I got there early, okay? And so he saw me and we sat down and I said to him, I said, the reason that I'm here is that I wanted you to, I didn't want you to be surprised in the courtroom. I wanted you to know what was coming down the pike. And I said, I've been appointed as a special master in the superior court and I'm here to observe this case and I just wanted you to know what I was doing there. And he said, well, thank you. He appreciated that, okay? And I was very lucky. I met a judge who basically had integrity and intelligence. I don't know, God must have been on my side or something. Whatever the, the influence was, uh, it, it was perfect for our first time. And uh, so and while I was talking to him, and another, a, an attorney walked in just came into the office, apparently he was accustomed to it, and he started talking to the judge. And lo and behold, he's gonna to talk to the judge about this very same case. And he, he looked at me, he thought I was an attorney, he wasn't worried, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, the judge was no dummy. <laughs> he, he could see that this is highly illegal, what this guy was doing. In my case, I was a representative of the Superior Court. In this guy's case, he was a representative of one of the parties trying to talk to the attorney without the other party present. Big difference, legally. So he, the judge said, wait a wait a minute. He says, this is getting too complicated. We need to go, go on the record. <laughs> and that's how he cut off this, this attorney. So we all exited. When it came my turn to talk, I stood up. I was right standing. I had the, the public defender on the right who had been assigned to the case. I had the prosecutor on my left who was a different person than the person that walked in and uh, is a lady and so I introduced myself I said I'm so-and-so I said I've been appointed as a special master in the Superior Court of California and I said uh, uh, I'm here to observe the proceedings in this particular matter and I said I am here and now declaring this the Superior Court of the State of California open and in session so here we were one courtroom and two courts okay did you have a quick question uh, yes, Bill. Um, there on your pleading, uh, where it says, in this court of record, how do we know that the judge himself is going to understand what that means? We don't care. We don't care. Right. Anything he does, he'll get the explanation as to why he's wrong later. Okay. Right now, we just put in the minimum. We're not raising issues. We let them raise the issues. Okay. So when he issues a, an unlawful order because he's not authorized, that's when we say, here's why you can't issue that order, and we vacate it. By then it's too late because he should have objected in the beginning. Right. If you don't object, you must have agreed. Remember that principle? Yes. That's why we suck them in this way. And who objects to such a benign sentence? I'm one of the people, and in this court of record, well, everybody knows it's a court of record, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, court of record has four requirements, not the two that the attorney sees in his latest dictionary, <laughs> okay? So anyway, back to the story. So in this, uh, uh, I went on to say 
that uh, I was here to proceed. I declared the court open and in session. And so uh, the uh, judge then asked me what it was or something we that uh, he said to me, he wanted to know what it, what it was. And so I said, well, there's a, a pending habeas corpus hearing in the Superior Court, and it involves um, you know, certain uh, common law rights and issues that are, are not yet resolved. And he said, well, he says the common law has no standing in this court. And so I said, well, you're absolutely right. I, I, Your Honor, I said, I agree. However, in Miranda versus Arizona, the court said that where substantive rights are concerned, there shall be no rulemaking. And he said, yes, that's correct. He agreed. Everybody knew the Miranda case. Okay? Now, here's the, here's the funny thing in that little conversation. He's saying the common law rights are not recognized, but substantive rights are common law rights. <laughs> There's no difference. But it's all in the language you use. You see, they don't want the common law. And I understood what he was saying, so I didn't, look, I'm not there to undermine his court. I'm there for a whole different purpose, okay? So if, if he wants to recognize the substantive rights and not recognize common law rights, I'm comfortable with that, you know? We'll roll with that. So, so I, I acknowledge that, and then he acknowledged the substantive rights. And then he says to me, he says, well, what do you want from me? Now, that was a trap, because <clears throat> I don't want anything from him. It's the court that I represent that wants him to do something or not do something. See, a little subtlety there. And so I said, and this is, this is word for word what I said, I still have it burned in my memory. I said, it is the wish. You remember, sovereigns, they wish, they don't order. Okay, my wish is your command kind of thing. That's a legal concept. I said, it is the wish of the superior court that the municipal court release jurisdiction of this matter to the superior court until such time as the issues in the superior court are settled. And he said, I will do that if you will give me the order in writing. And I said, well, I came only half prepared. I said, I do have a, an order half prepared. But I said, I didn't know how things would go, so I didn't know how to finish the order. But if you will recess the case, and w when you recall the case, I will be prepared with an order for you. And he said, fine. And so he did recess it, and he moved on with the other 50 criminals that were in there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, was a, it was a production line operation he had gone. And, uh, and that's what I did. I, hand, I had the first half was computer printed. The second half was hand printed. And I, I took it, and I made copies and all that r routine. And then when he recalled the case, I then uh, presented it to him. He read it out loud, and then he ordered that it be filed into the record. Okay, And then that was really essentially the end of the proceeding. One thing that happened, though, during the proceeding that was really interesting. During our discussion, there was a pause, Okay, kind of like a dead moment of silence where we're trying to recoup our thoughts or something. The prosecutor stood up. And she said, Your Honor, who is this man? <laughs> I've never seen him before. I don't know what he's doing here. <laughs> the judge sat there and stared her down. He just looked at her. He didn't say one word. She sat down, and then he turned back to me, and he picked up on the conversation as though she was never there. Oh now, you know that the judges and the prosecutors are in bed with each other all the time, you know? I mean, and for him, and when he did that, I knew I had something. Because such a discourtesy, I mean, I saw it as an outright discourtesy on his part, so deviated from the normal uh, collegiality of, of, of this whole atmosphere. And I knew I had something. My knees were still shaken, by the way. But I knew I had something, and it turned out I did, okay? So there's a long story that follows that, but that actually happened, and, and, and it worked. So that gave me the confidence to go on to further things. If I'd met a mean judge, who knows where, I could have ended up in jail as far as I knew.
What year was that, Bill? Mm, gosh, that was back in the mid 80s or late 80s. Yeah. And then we developed the concept further. We've issued lots of orders since then. Never had a single order directly answered. Never. They've played games to get around it, so forth. So, uh, for uh, one time, um, this guy had a default. So the judge removed the default by order. And then he, and he ordered a uh, pretrial hearing. And so we, what we did is we issued an order reinstating the default and removing the hearing from the calendar. Okay, this was signed by the sovereign plaintiff. All right. And we also included in that order that the judge was not to put, not to enter any more orders into this case. A direct order to the judge, and we served the judge with a copy of it. So about a month went by, and I got this desperate call from the plaintiff. He says, I don't know what to do. I said, to do about what? He says, there's a pretrial hearing in two days. I said, no. We, this is a different date anyway, but we took the pretrials off calendar. He says, he says, no, he says, you've got a pretrial hearing and I don't know what to do. So I said, well, how did this happen? <laughs> you know, and we issued our orders. Well, it turned out that the judge created a new order. He then put a cover letter on the order and he mailed the cover letter and the order to the plaintiff. And in the cover letter, he instructed the plaintiff to take this order and file it with the clerk, which he did. So the order, which we had ordered the, clerk, the, the judge never to file in, did not get filed in by the judge. It got filed in by sovereign authority. <laughs> Do you see what happened? You, you missed that workaround. The judge was ordered never to file another order into the case. So what the judge did was he created an order. We never told him not to create an order. Okay. He then mailed the order with the cover letter instructing the plaintiff to take it and file it himself as the sovereign of the court. Right? So he filed it in, so we're back on <laughs> for a new pretrial hearing. Well. We took care of that by, with a writ of error. We issued, that was a mistaken procedure. So we ordered that again off calendar. And again, we ordered the, you know, just vacated that order. <laughs> again, by sovereign authority. But this poor guy, he, he wasn't really nice guy. Hearts was in the right place and so forth. But he himself, as a plaintiff, had not the full picture. <laughs> And he, and he just very obediently went down and filed this order in. <laughs> and they took it in because, after all, it's the it's sovereign that's speaking, right? <laughs> so we could not convict the judge. He didn't do it. <laughs> so anyway, but it showed, it was another proof that what we were doing was on the right track. See? And, and throughout the history of what we've been doing, the judges or whoever it is, they try workarounds, but they never directly attack the orders. So I assume that means we're right. OK, I'm trying to find something here for you guys. Um, so what should he have done, Bill? Did he just ignore it? Yeah, he shouldn't have filed it. Yeah, <laughs> he should have just burned it or something. Or put it in his private file. <laughs> Circular file, something. Okay, let's go at, um, let's see. Uh, I got to find this thing here. No, I only get called when the train is about one foot away and they want me to stop it. <laughs> Bill, what court was that? Uh, I think that was in the uh, United States uh, District Court. 
that dealt with uh, the Santa Barbara area out that way. I don't know which court that is, but it, it was that one out that way. Uh, so uh, I'm saying it was a little in response to the judge that it was the wisdom superior court to have this. Oh, that court. That that was a different case. That was in uh, that was in uh, uh, I think it was Redwood City. Up in up near San Francisco. Can we file our motions, our, our claims and motions online, or do we physically have to go into the court now? Some courts do, some courts don't. The ones that do, I think you have to pre-register as using that method. Okay. They, they and they want facsimiles of your signature and, and various things. You know, okay. it can be convenient if you're a regular customer of theirs. Um, let's finished. see. Raw <laughs> notes. <coughs> yeah. Okay, we're back in procedure. Yeah, I'm going to procedure here, action at law. Um, here we go. I think this is it. Action at law. And here's a counterclaim. I wanted to show you the structure of a counterclaim. Okay. <coughs> If you go to the website, the very first page of the website has a search engine. So if you know some key words, you can find this stuff. I use it myself. I forget where I hide things. All right, here's a counterclaim. And this is the proper form for a counterclaim in California. Okay, other states have other formats. First of all, you have your own contact information. Either the attorney's name goes up there or your own name if you don't, do not have an attorney. And so, and then you put your job title. In this case, his job title is counter plaintiff. Okay? Make sense so far, everybody? Yes. Okay. So, then you have here, you have the title of the court. The, uh, the upper right is all, this upper right area is always blank for the clerk stamp. Okay, then uh, you have, <clears throat> on the right side, you have the nature of the paper, a title. In this case, it's a counterclaim, and then a little hint as to what it's about for trespass and trespass on the case, and it's verified. Verified means that you are saying you're declaring under penalty of perjury that all of the facts that you put in there are true and correct. That's what verified means. When you do a verified uh, action or complaint, the other side must have a verified answer. Okay? That forces them to go on the line of telling the truth. Otherwise, they can lie and get away with it. The, uh, then you see the people of the state of California versus Anderson. Now, that's the original case that he's counterclaiming against. So it's, it was a criminal proceeding against him. The people of the state of California versus Anderson. But this is a counterclaim. So below that, he puts his, what he has, okay? There we go. So in the bottom part, it's Anderson counter plaintiff versus the counter defendants. And he names all these people. Now, I don't think he names the people. Oh, he says, he, he couldn't read the signature of the person who signed the complaint. Mm. And when he went to the DA's office to find out, they refused to tell him whose signature that was. 